so today I want to speak on, on um, expectations. What can we expect as a Christian and, uh, uh, from God and uh, in connection with our life, the manifestation of, of God in our life? There's certain things that we can expect. And uh, I want to put it this way. Your expectation is what opens your heart to what God wants to do. You know, so it's not that God says, I'm not going to do it until you expect it. But the way we function is we are beings that when we expect something, then it kind of happens to us. Not because it wasn't available, but because we open ourselves up for it. And if we don't know what to expect from God, it's going to be difficult to, to have your heart opened to what needs to happen in your life because of what Christ has already done for you. Um, it's like if, if you go and buy a phone and you only expect from that phone to make a call. Now these days, phones aren't very good with, you know, to make a call with. You struggle with signal. Um, you know, m most of the smartphones, the signal part of it is not very strong, not very good. But it can do many other things. Because the expectation that people have of a phone has changed. They expect it to be uh, a diary. They expect it to be a, a, a medium through which they can go on the web, through which they can plan their whole day, and many other things, you know. And, and, I mean, and we can today, if you've got a smartphone, you can expect certain things. You know, if I look at the phone, then I think, man, um, this thing must be able to be a torch. And then I go and I look for an app, torch app, and then it becomes a torch. You know, because I know I can expect a lot of things from this phone. And in the same way, we need to realize what we can expect from God. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, the first thing that I believe that we can expect um, for the rest of our lives is that we will function like God. Amen. We function like God. You know, if I've got kids, those kids function like me. What I mean by that is the following. They will forever be in a place, now forever talking about the earth dispensation, they will be in a place where they will need physical food on a daily basis. Because I'm like that. They're born from me. They will always be a, a people that are in need of fellowship. Because they're made in my image and in my likeness. They will have a desire, you know, to seek or have a relationship with God. Because they are a human. They, they, they like me. In the very same way, when we are made by God, we have got the same desires and the same function as God. Or we function in the same way. Ons functioneer soos God. Ons kan nie op ander manier functioneer as wat hy functioneer. We function like God. Now, let's look at one of the ways in which God functions. God is a being that is defined by love. Because the Bible says, if you don't have love, you are nothing. Meaning, if God doesn't have love, He is nothing. Meaning that the love that is in God brings forth God. God is love. And if God is a being that finds his identity and finds the manifestation of the real him in love, guess what? You can't expect anything different from yourself. You are a being that will only see who you really are based on being love. Now, the Bible clearly says that we cannot love unless we are loved. So you first have to receive the love in order for you to have that love, to be that love. Okay? So, if God functions that way, if the foundation of God is love, if, if love is what makes God exist, the very same with us. And we can never expect anything different from ourselves. We can expect always, we can always have this expectancy that you will be a person that needs to experience love all the time. Don't think that you can ever go without feeling loved. 
And then I want to just say this about love and a, a human being. You know, the strongest, if you go and study a little bit of psychology and, uh, and some other stuff, you will realize that a human being, his brain has got a certain amount of energy that it radiates. But the heart has got six times more energy that it radiates than the mind. Okay, your heart. Because with your heart you believe, with your heart you feel. The strongest thing that will ever influence your mind is not knowledge, but feeling. Forever it will be like that. It is not just knowledge. Let me give you a good example. Imagine I feel that people don't like me. Say I feel a good friend of mine, he doesn't like me. But he says all the time, man, I like you. But I feel he doesn't like me. Do you know that I'll be worried about it all the time? My mind will be full of it. It will control the way I look at him. It will control the way I interpret everything he says. Because emotion always supersedes knowledge. You, people can come to you. I see from your whole mind. Come on, give me a better example. You can feel, people can come to you and say, man, you look so good, but if you feel fat, it doesn't matter what they say. Do you understand now? I see some of the ladies understand now. Okay. What you feel always supersedes, and you can expect that. Why? Because God is such a being. What he feels about mankind supersedes the knowledge he had about our sin. Come on now. He could not define us by the knowledge of our bad works and what we've done wrong. He could only define us based on who he is. He is love and God exists. He will forever exist. He's eternal, undying, living forever because he is love and he feels, he's got an emotion, he's, he's emotionally attached to the human race. He's that kind of a being. So we need to realize that there's never going to be a place where we will have to push aside our feelings and just live by willpower. Thank you, Jesus. God's never going to have us live like that. Because that is a very weak form of living. It is a mediocre form. I mean, it's like, um, imagine Helena and I, I mean, we married. Her mind says, you've got to stay with this guy. But her heart says, I want to leave. That is not quality of life. When, when, when I, I mean, being married to Elena, having children, the desire that I have is to raise my kids in such a way that they want to be in my house. To love my wife in such a way that she wants to be with me. Now, we are like that and we are never going to change. For God is like that. That's why the Bible says God works in you to will. So I want to work in my in my, the lives of my family in such a way that they want to. Not decide to, but want to. And from the want, they can have knowledge that is in line with the want that's in their heart. Please don't think that I say knowledge is not important. All I'm saying is that, and you can even by just knowledge and willpower, mind power, you can kind of live a, a fairly good life in this world. But it cannot be compared with a life where you feel special, where you feel loved. So what we can expect is that we will be beings that are designed to function like God because we are in His image, we are in His likeness. He is a being that feels. You know, when God looked at man, and we look at the word agape that I preached here two weeks ago, the word agape means to lose your breath over, to be content with, okay? God looks at the world and He says, you know, I'm going to give everything so that I can buy the land, 
so that I can get the, the, the treasure that's buried in the land. Why? Because inside him, it's more than just the knowledge of our value. There's an emotional attachment that God has for us. God is not this God that is distant, that's got a, a set of rules whereby you must live, give the world principles by which they must live to try and conduct a good life. No, he's a being, he's a family orientated being that made man in this form, husband, wife with children, family. He's a, he functions from family, his father, son and Holy Spirit. He brought us into that kind of living where what we feel, what a husband feels for his wife and what he feels for his kids is what's going on in the heart of God. Amen. And you need to know that that's never going to change. Expect for God to work the right feeling in your heart. That's what you can expect. One of the things. This is the first thing I want you to know. We can expect that God will work a feeling in your heart. We've been taught by, uh, by the, 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 the word of faith, and I don't want to break down a certain church denomination or a way of belief, but traditionally and uh, uh, in extreme word of faith, what was taught was faith is not feelings. <coughs> but I want to tell you, belief is a feeling. The strongest belief that there can be is when you are so overwhelmed by a feeling that God will provide for you. This feeling can be based on certain facts in Scripture and certain facts uh, on, on what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. But when the thing starts to work is when you feel it in your heart. Come on, man. I feel that I will be cared for. I've got that feeling. I've got a feeling inside me and this feeling is not based on me trying to create some life for myself of success but this feeling is based on a love relationship between me and the Father and He worked in me to will. Okay? That I can feel this feeling inside me and the feeling inside me that I have is that I will have a happy marriage. I just feel it. I've got the feeling that my children will be okay. And I look with my eyes, I say, sometimes at certain things, my mind says, it can't be because look at this, look at this, look at this. But there's an overwhelming feeling. Thank you, Jesus. Now that's how God works. But we've been robbed from that. We've been taught that you can't function like that. Because feeling is wrong. Now, feeling was always wrong because we were under the wrong message. And the wrong message brought the wrong feeling then you better not do what you feel or you're going to destroy your life. Yeah. Hmm. But when you're under the right gospel, you feel loved, you feel precious, you feel cared for. Sure. Amen. So know this, you will forever be a, a person that functions from uh, the, the deepest, most powerful thing that will ever influence your life in this world. The deepest, most powerful thing that will ever influence the way you deal with people is the measure in which you feel loved. Amen. 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 I want to tell you, no human being possesses the power to give you adequate, adequate love feeling. <coughs> Herein is love, that He gave His Son as the propitiation or the sacrifice for our sins, so that we can now live through Him. The hearing is love, the, the revelation of your innocence, of your equality with God, not because of your good works, but because of His choice to make you His kind. That revelation, that, that emotion that goes with the revelation that you will forever be perfect before God because of the blood of Jesus. That emotion is feeling loved. That influences how you see people, that gives birth to, to, to all those kind of things that's good in your life. The Bible says in Romans 6 verse 13 that we need to yield our members as instruments of righteousness. Okay? Yield your members as instruments of righteousness. Now, traditionally that was seen as don't sin. But that's not what's written there. 
So it was written, the, the Bible says, yield your member as an instrument of righteousness. The word yield, do you know what the word yield means? The word yield means to put next to. So, put yourself next to righteousness. What does that mean? I see myself as fully righteous. Fully righteous before God, having the full right of the fullness of God manifesting in my life free from my willpower. But born in me. What we can expect in our life forevermore is that we will never get it right to have God's quality of life by trying to obey scriptures. But that the only way that we will have His quality of life is by birth. By Him giving birth to it in our lives. Yes, sir. That's the only way. We can never expect anything else. That is how we will function forevermore. We can expect that. We can expect that the only lasting thing in our lives that will concerning quality of life will be if God gave birth to it in our lives. You can expect that if you have um, a, a, a long suffering or kindness based on the Bible says I must have long, long suffering and kindness and now I'm going to try and do it. You can expect that it's going to fail. Sometime. You can expect it. But once the revelation of who Jesus is, the, when you come to the place where you can place yourself next to Him, that means yield. If you want to yield to God, how do you yield to God? The Greek word for yield means to put yourself next to. That's what it means. Put yourself next to God. How do, how do we have a legal right to put ourselves next to God? Yes, He took man and put man next to God in the heavens. By raising Jesus Christ up and putting a man in the Godhead. Representing every one of us. So we can, the only way you yield to God is not by trying to obey the Ten Commandments, trying to obey even the Beatitudes, but seeing yourself in equal place with God because of Christ. That's yielding to Him. Now, when you do that, then you yield your body to be an instrument that God uses to manifest who He is in this world. And do you know how much effort it takes on, on your behalf? A zero. It's good news, man. Man, ek en God is om my blij. Dit is goeie nies. Halleluja, man. Imagine the way you yield to God. We always thought that yield is, God stands there, He says, you shall do this, and then you say, okay, I will. That's not the yielding the Bible talks about. The true yielding God talks, the Bible talks about is God comes and He says to a sinner, Listen, I paid for the sin of the whole world, including yours. Okay? And what I then did as a representative of you, I went and sat at the right hand of God, meaning the righteousness that I possess for free, or that I possess by my works, by what I did, is yours for free. Yielding would be, well, if that's so, then I agree. What can I do about it? I can't be against it. Who can be against the truth? You can do nothing against the truth. That is the truth. All you can do is refuse to accept it and live a defeated life. That's all. You can live in the lie forevermore. You know, we, we spoke about, uh, uh, in the week we had a case where um, someone <coughs> molested a child, okay, years ago. In the meantime, this person went, and, and this person was also in a young age where, 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 when this happened, and um, apologized 20 times, cried, felt sorry, you know, and the whole thing. And... Both sides are okay with it, but other people who hear of this is not okay anymore with this. They hear about it for the first time. And now it's becoming a very big issue. 
And what we then realized was what's happening here is the quicker both parties accept or yield to the fact that they can never be defined by virginity or never be defined by what they've done but there is only one place of definition which is the embodiment of God in human flesh the quicker it will all be over Amen sir, Amen, Amen. There is no other way out. Or they can live in the lie for the rest of their life and that deed will kill both of them until Jesus comes. Yes, sir. Or you can be free today. Yes, that, that's how simple it is. Yield yourself to the truth. Put yourself equal to Jesus. And I say, Beth, you can't say that. Well, listen, and I've said it many times, if God did that, if God in His being a sovereign God, He decides what He wants to do. If He decided to take the sin of the whole world away, what can we do about it? If He decided to put a man in the Godhead as repre representing me and you, what can we do about it? If He decided to give you a sovereign will wherein you can make use of this or not, what can we do about it? We can do nothing about it. All we can do is we can say, I'm going to benefit from this in this way by agreeing with this truth. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, this truth is an obsolete truth. You can't get away from it. Jesus took away the sin of the world. Amen. And we can expect, you know, that we will never change in how we function. You will always be a being. What can I expect for tomorrow? You can expect for tomorrow that you'll always be a being that functions from persuasion. You have to be persuaded about something for it to influence your heart. You have to be persuaded. You need to be persuaded that God loves you. Now that persuasion cannot come from decision of your will. That persuasion comes from correct knowledge. Amen. Hearing the right thing about you so that persuasion becomes part of your heart. You'll always be a being that functions from persuasion because God functions from persuasion. Persuasion, another word for persuasion is the word faith. Faith, unfortunately, brings a negative connectivity in our hearts. You know, because we've been, if you don't faith, you're going to go to hell. Okay? But that's not God's plan. God's plan was not to say, if you don't faith, you're going to go to hell. What God was saying is, you are a faith being. You function from your persuasion. And this persuasion that, you, that, that is in your heart determines your life. So let me persuade you of my love. Because that's how the Godhead functions. That's how Father, Son and Holy Spirit functions. There's one thing we need to accept. We will never ever be outside a family relationship as pertaining to God. Never. The, oh, you cannot relate to Him based on slavery. You cannot re relate to Him based on you serving Him. He came to serve you by giving you an op a place in the Godhead. Making you part of a family. That's how He served you. You can never get away from that. It's always going to be like that. It's never going to change. You're always going to be part of a family that functions this way. The father loves the mother. Okay, the love you see between the father and the mother influences your heart. It brings forth joy in you. It brings forth righteousness in you. Never ever can you relate to God on the basis of that. For the Bible says in Ephesians 2 that before the foundation of the world, and the Greek word there before talks about time, before in time, before the world was made, God decided that the only way we can be before Him is holy, blameless, above reproach in His love. Talking about love, you know, a God that loves, cares, family relationship again. God decided the only way that man can ever be before Him is blameless. He decided that before the earth was made. Then man sinned. Then God said, man cannot come before me in such a way, for I decided they shall never be in a place where they feel indebted to me. And I will remove all their debt, I will remove all their guilt, and I will place them in a place where they are holy and blameless in my agape for them. And that's the only way that man can ever stand before God. Amen. And that's what you can expect. And any other gospel or any other message that does not 
uh, that's not in this framework is a lie. Amen. But Bertie, how do I know this is really the truth? There's a resonance in your heart, man. There isn't a higher voice as the inner voice that says, I always knew God had to be good. <laughs> and now that he's preached as a good God, all the stuff you heard that could contradict that might say it can't be because I've got this. Listen, every sect has got his scripture. Yes. Know that. Every sect has got his scripture. I want to say this, this gospel I preach, thank God for the, for the Bible, okay, and these scriptures. But the best translation you can ever find is not Hebrew Bible, it's not Greek Bible, it's not Strong's definitions of the Greek letters, it's not some lexicon explaining to you the, the, the tenses of every word. It's not even the O Afrikaans vertalen. The best translation that there could ever be is the incarnation. Hallelujah. If you want to know what does God say, you don't need a Bible, my friend. You need a, you need a message. The message is God is incarnated into a human being. That is the final word. That's God's conclusion about you. Sure. And you can decide if you want to obey the word or not. Then you take the word and you read that word in these scriptures. <laughs> or you are reading scripture and you're not reading word. <laughs> okay. That's the way it works. We will forever be that. We can expect that. What can we expect when we are in the message of grace? What can we expect? Let's look at some of the stuff we can expect. More practical stuff. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.10 that we are created, we are His workmanship, created unto good works, that He prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, how do, what does He say about that? Beforehand, God lived in good works in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, if you say God speaks, then you've got to ask yourself, if you say God speaks, to who does He speak? I mean, you can't say God speaks, and He's in heaven, He was alone forever. No, no, to who, did he, to who does He speak? If you say God is love, well, who does He love? That's why in Christianity, and I, I believe, the true Christianity believes in the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God. They have influenced one another in such a way that the only way that, that, that the influence that the Father had on the Son was so great that the Father now fully lives in the Son. You know, if you send your kids to the club every night, every weekend, you know the club will have such an influence upon them that the club will fully live in them after a year. Yeah. That's the way it is. The Father had such an influence upon the Son and the Son such an influence upon the Father that you can't see a difference between them. That Jesus prayed and says, this is my prayer, Father, that they can be one with us as we are one. John 17. Okay? That was the prayer. That was the, 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 the end goal. Now, between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were good works. They, they are good works. They love each other. They speak well of each other. They see good in each other. Those good works was there but in the Godhead all the time. Then God said, these good works I now, before time, make available for people that they can now, and I, I create them in such a way that they can effortlessly function in these good works. That's what it says there. We are His workmanship, His poema, His love poem. Okay? That He spoke and his workmanship, what he created from his innermost being, and we were created, and, and there was, we were created for good works. You know what? We were created to be a being that functions from such a persuasion of the value of another person that we can easily do good to them. Amen. That was never a command, it was a part of our design. But because of the lie in Adam, through tradition, it became a command. The fruit of the Spirit is not a command. 
It is a promise. God promises you and says the following, should you be in the Spirit, and then he goes in Galatians 3 and explains what the Spirit is. The Spirit is believing this good news. The flesh is to, be, to believe the law. And for those of you that are here for the first time, let me explain that quickly. I don't want you to be confused about this. When you are in the flesh, the Bible, whenever it says being in the flesh, it talks about the Jews that sought their righteousness by flesh. Okay? Meaning, I'm a Jew, and because I'm a Jew, I've, I'm, I'm God's children, and therefore I've got to obey the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and all the other laws of Moses. That's what they said. Okay? I'm a Jew, I've got to... It means I sought my righteousness in my flesh, in the fact that I'm a Jew. It was literally talking about circumcision in the flesh. So being in the flesh was saying, I'm circumcised in the flesh, and... Being circumcised in the flesh, the laws was given to you because the laws wasn't given to the Gentiles, it was given to the Jews. So if you were in the flesh, you were placing yourself under laws. So being in the flesh, when Paul says, when we are in the flesh, it doesn't mean when I feel a lust to sin. No, when I'm in the flesh is when I want to be saved and be righteous by my works. Amen. That's being in the flesh. He says, then you can expect these things. And he, and he calls all kinds of wicked sins. But then he says, when you're in the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, meekness, temperance, and faith. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That is the expectation that we have that believe the grace gospel. Because a promise is made to us that when you are in the Spirit, you will find agape in your life. Because God made you to love. Love was never a command. Love is not a command. My goodness. The Bible says, but now you might say, but the Bible says a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Let me explain that verse. It says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That word that there in the Greek means the following. It means so that. A new commandment I give unto you, so that you can love one another as I have loved you. That changes the whole thing. That still leaves you with a question, what is the new commandment? <laughs> we thought the new commandment is that we must love one another as Jesus loved us. That's not the new commandment. That will happen when you obey the new commandment. And what is the new commandment? The new commandment is to believe upon Jesus. That's the command. If He commands you to do something, He says, Believe! You believe in God, but believe also in Me. There was Peter. He wanted to create his own place in the heaven. He said, Jesus, I'll die with you so that I can be where you are. That was actually what he wanted. I'll die with you that I can go with you to the Father. Jesus said, why do you want to die to have a place with the Father? He says, don't let your heart be troubled. I'll prepare a place for you. Then I will come and take you to where I am. Why do you want to sacrifice to be where I am? You don't have to sacrifice to get where I am. I'll sacrifice and then I'll take you free from your effort to where I am. Come on. Sure. That's the gospel. And then he said to Peter when he came with his sacrificed gospel, he said, your heart's troubled, my boy. Your heart's troubled. The word troubled there comes from the Greek word where you take a stone and throw it in a, in a pond and those ripples that come. Your belief system got uh, uh, stirred in a wrong way. That's what he said to Peter. You're not believing the right thing anymore. You should believe in me. The new command. This is the command. The only command we have from God. Believe in Jesus. <laughs> this command he gave to empower us. That we can expect agape towards all people. I don't want to love people with just a friendship love. I've not been made for that. I don't want to just be angry every day when this guy does that wrong and that guy. I, I, we, I've not been made for that. Before the foundation of the world, something was made. And then I've been designed in the image of, of a being where that is natural. 
So what we can expect is to agape people. What agape means is to lose your breath over, to be content with, remember I preached about it two, two weeks ago, to lose your breath over. What it means is to see the ID number or the, 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 the chassis number on the person. For those of you that, that wasn't here, what I said was uh, uh, a couple of years ago or some years ago in the US, they, they, this guy bought a car on an auction. It was an old beaten up um, AC Cobra. And this AC Cobra was in such a mess. But they knew it was a very old Cobra and it would be under the first hundred maybe that was ever made. And he restored it, and as he restored it, stripped the whole thing, he, he saw the chassis number. And they took the chassis number to AC Cobra to see what car was it. And it was the first AC Cobra ever built. All of a sudden, the old Cobra that was worth $50,000 was all, all of a sudden worth 5 million or 10 million. Even if it was lying in pieces in the garage. Okay, look at the value. It's in pieces, but the value is determined based on the number. So, when we believe in God, what we believe in Christ, what can we expect? We can expect agape to flood our minds. So what do we do now? In, in our heart, our heart is expecting this. Our heart is not feeling condemned because of this. Our heart is now expecting this. There's a big difference. If I come and I read, I want to read to you the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. 99% of all the time, all people will feel condemned when I read those things. You'll feel, I don't measure up. But when I read it to you, what you're supposed to feel is, you, you, you know, oh yeah, today is Aubrey's birthday. Okay? This morning... My, we're still going to buy his present today. Because you know with him it's difficult. He, you know? So the, the, the younger brothers gave him presents. Now, you know when he wakes up, first he, he wakes up, he goes to the toilet. Then we, we say, oh, he's not in the room. So we wait in the kitchen. We say to him, okay, go and pretend you sleep. <laughs> so that we can wake you up now and sing, you know, and pray for you and everything. So we did, we did that. But, you know, when he gets the presents... There's an emotion in his heart. That emotion is, wow, something is given to me for free. I've got an expectation of opening this up and seeing something of value. Understanding Galatians 5.22 correctly, that emotion is supposed to be in your heart when you read the fruit of the Spirit. Is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's the present given to you freely the ability to see other people and you see them not maybe their life is apart like that AC Cobra but all you can see is the chassis number that's all you can see you can't see their works you can't see what to do wrong because your mind got flooded with a universal truth and that is that man is defined in God peace love Joy, joy, bliss, having great joy. I mean, that is promised to us. So what I do, and this is what I said to Helena, my expectation is for joy to be in my heart based on this revelation because of the resurrection power of Christ and not my doing. Peace. The, the, the word peace means the emotion of not being indebted. So what can you expect when you study and know and feel loved by God? You can expect an emotion in your heart that you are not indebted. Hallelujah! There's one place where you don't ever have to feel indebted. It's in the presence of God. In the Old Testament, there's a verse, a Krefler Dollar mentioned this the other day. And he said, in the Old Testament, they had a list of stuff of people that were not allowed to come before God. If you had a blind eye, broken foot, this, 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 a list of things. You couldn't come before God. It even says, if you've got a flat nose, you can't come before God. That's funny, man. You can't come before God. In Leviticus, I think it's 19. 
Almost nobody can come before God. With my ears, I'll definitely not be able to come before God. Because I can hear from a distance. I don't have to come close. So anyway... <laughs> so, so anyway... Who can come before God? Only the pure. Now the Bible says, come boldly to the whole world. Yeah. Why? Because there's no flat-nosed, broken foot, broken arm person in God's eyes anymore. Because Jesus took it all away. And then, when you hear this gospel, what can I expect? I can expect that I will start to love people. I can expect that I will have peace in my heart. I can expect that fear for the future concerning finances will completely diminish. That it will leave my life. I can expect generosity to become part of my life. I can expect what I see in Christ, free from my effort, manifest in me, being born in me. Amen. This message, when I preach it to you, it would be like you... Preaching, say Helena was pregnant, and you could speak to the child in the womb and tell him what he can expect. You can expect that you're going to look like your parents. You're going to expect to grow up in a house like this. You're going to expect that your father will be a preacher. You can expect that you'll travel some countries with your dad. You can expect that, that he will love you. You can expect that he will do everything for you. You can tell him that before the time that's not a command unto him you can tell him listen your dad will love you so much it will influence you unto you loving others as he loves them you can tell that to that unborn child and that is what I'm telling you today that's our expectation we can have of God I want to end off thank you Lord for the good news you know, John, 1 John 4, John was so persuaded of the power of love. You know that song? I wish I could sing. I could, then I would have been saying Jennifer Rush now. <laughs> 1 John 4, 8. That's too, for some people will never know who's Jennifer Rush. It's older people. <laughs> Look how blatant John, called the apostle of love, is about this. He says... He that loves not, knows not God. For God is love. He didn't say that in a condemning way. That is actually a compliment to the power of God's love. John was so persuaded of God's love. He says that he that loves, knows God. For God is love. So what can we expect in the presence of a loving God? Is, to, is that that love will be born in us. That's what we can expect. That's what we can expect. What I find, and, and unfortunately this is what I see, I, I see it on the web, I see it in, in, in different churches, is the moment we hear the love of God, some people, not all, but a, a small percentage of people, I see, expect that they will always be slaves of sin, they will always be slaves of hurt and fear. And they expect that God will not be angry with them. Now, it's true. God will not be angry. But why do you want to expect something that you're not supposed to expect? If you look at it scientifically, you know, or, or, or mathematically, if you say one plus one, what are you going to expect? Two. Now, we say one plus one and you still expect one. You deceived. How can you say, I expect? And this is the problem that I have many times with people, especially if you watch via the web, where people say, if you preach grace, you just preach a license to sin. So in other words, what you say is, if you take a human being that was created, be, uh, created before the foundation of the world, there was a plan in the creation of man that this man is designed, made, to function ha and have the same attributes as the maker. That's how it was made. Okay? To function under the influence of the maker. To be a vessel wherein the maker dwells and through whom the maker lives. Okay? That was how God made us. Now we say, God come 
God came and took away all that could bother you and get, uh, and get you to a place where that cannot be true in your life. He, 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 he tells you about your innocence. You believe upon Him. His Spirit comes and indwells you. You are loved by Him. You feel the emotion of being precious equals you're going to walk in fornication. How can you say that? How, how does your math work? No. If we take God's calculator, a human being, plus God loving him, plus the human believing it, equals God manifesting in human flesh. Amen. Finished. So to me, when I don't feel, when I don't see the fruit mentioned in my life I don't get despondent and say oh I, I messed up all I say is God obviously all this is showing me is I don't know how much you love me I don't know what you've done for me and I want a deeper wider revelation of this what can we expect when we see the love of God Galatians 4 says this way it says sorry Ephesians 3 from verse 14 onwards it says it this way it says I pray that your minds might be enlightened, that you may comprehend how high, how wide, how deep, and how long the love of God is. Now listen to this. So that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Amen. So what can we expect being loved by God? We can expect, I want to tell you, don't expect to be angry again next week. Don't expect to have failure upon failure, fear upon fear, you know, ab ab about your life. Listen, you expect God's manifestation in you free from your effort. That's what you expect. Hallelujah. I expect that without me begging God to do something for me in ministry, you know, that the ministry will just touch people's lives. I mean, I've opened myself up. I mean, so many times it's, it, it's so funny. This is, this is how we think about God, and, and I'm ending off for the third time. <laughs> this is what we say. God gave us, gave Berti a ministry. Okay? Now, when God gave Berti a ministry, He commanded him and said, You better preach. I called you to preach, and you must go and win those souls. If you don't win them, they're going to go to hell. Okay, God, I'll do it. Then God says, but I didn't make it easy for you. You will have to ask me for every little thing in this ministry. If you don't ask for a printer for your computer, you're going to have a computer without a printer. Huh? If you're not too specific, then my hands are shortened. I can't help you. <laughs> Plus, make sure you meditate all the time. And then your prayer life, my son. And these are all the things you need to do to get this ministry that I gave you to work. And if it doesn't work, people are going to go to hell and their blood is going to be taken from your hands. Happy are the called into the ministry. <laughs> rubbish it's a relationship what happened to me is I was so loved by God that who he was was born in me in a way that's natural to me and I felt I want to preach to people it wasn't God giving me a ministry in what I must do it is God living in a human that's what it is knowing my very thought he's intrigued by my thought and yours let me explain it you know I can go and do a personality study of my sons and I can tell you now Aubrey will when he's in a crisis situation he will deal with it this way Henry will deal with it this way Bertie will, oh, Bertis will deal with it that way okay different different children different personalities okay although I already know how they are gonna do things what they are gonna say how they are gonna react have you seen when, when a teenager comes from school the parents are almost amper bang om for my to see you know because you know 
The man is moog, yo. <laughs> if you understand what I say. There's, there's certain things in teenagers. It's like, you will not you will not with your rasni. I don't know if any of you ever experienced that. So it's like, because you, 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 know, you know that inside there is so much love and so much wonder. Okay? But you also know that there's a phase in the life is going through. So you know what to expect. But, what life is about is experiencing that person. Knowing that he will be that way is not what gives you life. What gives you life and what, what's blessed, what blesses you in this life is experiencing who he is. So even if God knows everything that you, all of you, all of your thoughts, you know, he loves to experience you. He's blessed by your experience. He's blessed by, by, by experiencing you. He's blessed by your presence. Do you think God is not blessed with the presence of Jesus at the right hand of the Father? That's the presence of human flesh in the Godhead. My goodness. Representing you, He is your presence in the Godhead. And He's blessed with your presence. And we were always only seeking His presence as if we play hide and seek. Richard Dawkins said, He's an atheist. He said, if he ever sees God, he says, he said, and say God do exist. He would say to God, God, they asked him, what will he say to God if God do exist? He says, I will say to God, God, why did you go through so much pain in hiding yourself? Now, the reason he says that is because he's looking for God in the wrong places. Yes, of course. You know? If you lose a, a big truck, it doesn't help you look for it inside this building. It's not yet. Everybody knows. But what happens is, you know, we've got this mentality like Richard Dawkins got. God hides himself. Yeah. But God came so close that you struggle to find him. <laughs> He's indwelling you. If, you. if you look outside you, you're looking in the wrong place. He came to indwell you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I better stop, man. I feel like I'm not begin. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you, Father, that your presence floods our lives on a daily basis. Thank you, thank you, thank you, my God. Thank you, Lord, that, that we can look at this salvation that you've given, it, given to us and we can work it out with reverence and the anxiety of never wanting to do it by our own power. And we can see salvation manifest. Thank you, Lord, that we've been saved from sin. We've been saved from the manifestation of the flesh. It is not our doing. Our choice is not to stop to sin. Our choice is to believe in you. And you resist sin in us. It's your work. Your word says that you cannot bear fruit on your own. Of your own you can do nothing. But Lord, we yield to you by seeing Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. And by seeing Him, we yield, place ourselves next to the Father. And when we yield to you, our members have been yielded as an instrument of righteousness and we expect the manifestation of what you promised us which is the Holy Spirit and the fruit of Him. Thank you Lord. Thank you Lord. And the last fruit we will receive is immortality. Thank you Jesus. Hallelujah.